there's a branch of the Christian family that relies heavily on what you might call I was lost but Jesus found me stories. These have featured prominently in the publishing houses that have picked up my work and as I married my publisher I have heard quite a few of them over the years. Prison to praise trajectories. People who were in debt or in criminal gangs or in some kind of mess of their own making who found faith and turned to Jesus and discovered hope restored and rebuilt their lives. Spiritual success stories. Such accounts are always heartwarming and uplifting, encouraging our faith that we are on the right track, we are on the path to glory. Jesus' parable of the prodigal son is one such story. The young man messed up everything to the max and ended up glad to eat the pig swill, which, if you are Jewish, is about as low as things can get. Then he came to himself and returned to his father's house where he was received with the generosity of unconditional love and forgiveness. I was lost, but Jesus found me. But then the prodigal son had an elder brother, didn't he? A patient, responsible, faithful, diligent elder brother who regarded the prodigal's homecoming with a level of incomprehension. Why haven't you ever had a party for me? He asked their father. And the father said, my son, you can have a party whenever you want to. But somehow the elder brother didn't want to. I suppose he was just a different kind of man who had made different choices and lived a different kind of life and the way he had taken had shaped the person he became. There's something I want to talk to you about this morning and I feel I owe you an apology because I'm coming at it from the perspective of the elder brother, not the party animal, homecoming prodigal. I felt we maybe should think about joy. Joy in heaven, Jesus said, over one sinner that repents. There is joy in heaven. In our call to worship from the Acts of the Apostles, we touched the joy that was so startlingly evident in the early church. Under intense persecution, flogged and thrown into prison, sitting in a crowded jail cell in irons, unable to sleep, Paul and Silas were singing hymns at midnight. Rejoicing in the Lord. I suggest to you that such resilience and effervescence of spirit is not likely to be put on. It wasn't affectation. They really were full of joy. In our reading from Philippians, we received the exhortation, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. And of the Galatians, who had drifted back to the requirements of the law from the state of grace they had received, Paul asks, what happened to all your joy? I would love to set before you a prison to praise 
Amazing Grace kind of story, encouraging you with a tale of how I was lost, but Jesus found me. But I have to confess that in thinking about the discipline of Christian joy, which I believe is of crucial importance, both in evangelism and in staying the course of faith, the question that confronts me is the same as the challenge to the Galatians. What happened to all your joy? As a teenager, I was fizzing with the joy of the Lord, eager for testimony and fellowship. As a young woman, I was zealous for the gospel, laying down its principles as the tracks upon which my life would run. As a middle-aged woman, I threw myself into ministry and service, constantly active in the work of the gospel, employing my heart and mind and life in sharing the beauty and truth that is in Jesus. I wrote and I preached and I poured myself out into that work. And now, in my 60s, long before I thought this would happen, I am tired and discouraged, weary and disappointed, and most of the time I'm worried. What has happened to all my joy? It's too long a story for this short time together, but it has to do with broken family relationships, with dismay at the political landscape and the inherent toxicity of growth economics and horror at the destruction of the natural world. Fire and flood and desertification refugees from torture and war drowning in the Mediterranean, a corrupt government that steals public money and increases public debt by trillions, a culture of lies in public life. These have overwhelmed my joy. In my personal life, battered by relational loss and the mediocrity of my vocational achievements, I lost hope, lost confidence, lost the desire for anything except peace and simplicity. Like the elder brother, the father says to me, you can have a party any time you want to. But like the elder brother, I have lost the aptitude I, who have so much to be grateful for, and I am grateful, feel like a tired survivor. I suspect, given the times we're in, that I am not alone. There must be so many others putting one foot in front of the other, counting our blessings, yes, but worried and weary and worn down. What I'm putting before you this morning is not a triumphant testimony, but if you, like me, are tired and worried and disappointed, the proposal that somehow we are missing something. If Paul and Silas, arrested and flogged and in irons, felt inclined in that sleepless midnight to choose joy, to sing hymns. Well, so can we. So can I. I think without joy, we have nothing to offer the world. The variety of Christianity that offers only disapproval and rebuke and criticism is of use to neither God nor man. It is, I think, absolutely imperative to rediscover joy. 
So this morning I'm not going to pretend to you that I have it, that I am shining with joy. But what I'm saying is that having lost it matters and I am going to set about tracking it down and reigniting it in my soul. In the time that remains to me on this earth, I am going to rediscover joy. I have the feeling that you cannot capture it, cannot imprison it. You have to work with it, give it breathing space, allow it to flourish. I think joy has to do with simplicity and generosity, with kindness and with not being too uptight. I don't think rules and dogma and rectitude do very much for joy. I think disapproval and criticism and too much orthodoxy are as useful to joy as dousing it with bleach. I think immersion in the natural world, sunrise and bird song, the wind in tall trees and the sparkle of sun on the ocean may foster joy. And just the company of Jesus, his love that never gives up on us, his grace that never grows old. This, for what remains of my life, is going to be my quest. Everything else can be ditched as unnecessary ballast. What has happened to all your joy? I have no idea, but I'm going to find out. I'm going to get it back.